Good afternoon, and um, for those of you celebrating Passover, Hak um, I I'm Melanie Holcomb. I'm a curator in the Department of Medieval Art and the Cloisters, and I hope um, all of you had, have already had an opportunity to have a look at the Rylands Haggadah, which is on view right now in the medieval galleries here in the main building. Um, it, if you've seen it, it, you know it is one of the most engaging manuscripts from the medieval period. It, will, it pulls you right in with all of its um, lively details and, um, and its sort of masterful piece of storytelling. It, it beats that, that movie, what was it, The Ten Commandments? <laughs> the Charlton Hester thing by a long shot. Um, while you're, uh, it, it will be here for six months, and during that time we will be changing turning the pages every month. Um, this week we, we've started appropriately with the season, showing you kind of the end of the sequence where we see um, medieval Jews celebrating Passover. But we're going to, next month, pick it back up at the very beginning of the story so that you'll be able to take yourself through that story month by month, um, that great story of the uh, Israelites' exodus from Egypt. So I hope you'll return again and again. Um, I, I cannot think of a better speaker to be here with us today as we, uh, are, as we begin this uh, long visit with the uh, Ryland Sagata than Professor Mark Michael Epstein from Vassar College. Uh, Professor Epstein has been teaching at Vassar since 1992 and where he was, he is, was the first director of Jewish studies there. He's a graduate of Oberlin College, uh, received his PhD at Yale University, and did much of his graduate research at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He's written on various topics in um, visual and material culture produced by, for, and about Jews. Um, during the 80s, Professor Epstein was director of the Hebrew Books and Manuscripts Division of Sotheby's Judaica Department, and he continues to serve as a consultant to various libraries, auction houses, museum, and private collections throughout the world, um, including among them the Herbert C. and Eileen Bernard Museum at Temple Emanuel here in New York, uh, for which he curated their inaugural exhibition. And all of that would be reason enough to have Professor Epstein here. Um, but in fact, it, it's really his the exceptional work that he has uh, recently published on the Violence Haggadah, um, among other very well-known and beloved um, Haggadot that made him a must-have for us here today. Um, his most recent book, The Medieval Haggadah, Art, Narrative, and Religious Imagination, published by Yale in 2011, was selected by the L London Times Literary Supplement as one of the best books of 2011. It's, um, for me, a, just a model of scholarship, both in terms of its erudition, but also the creativity um, that makes it such an engaging read and, and the best possible guide um, for each of the four manuscripts that he discusses. So it is, it's with no further ado, it is a great pleasure to have you here, Professor Epstein. Thank you for that um, overwhelming introduction. Uh, not the least of which is uh, the fact that I don't know if you were aware, you were just wished a Chag Sameach by the uh, curator of the medieval art in the cloisters at the Met, which is no doubt a, a first time occurrence. I'm very honored to be speaking with you this afternoon in one of my favorite places in the world. It's a magical kingdom to which I've been making pilgrimages ever since my father, an artist, uh, first brought me here when I was a tiny boy. My sincere gratitude to Melanie Holcomb and Barbara Drake Boehm for inviting me to deliver this talk, to Jennifer Mock for smoothing my way here, and to the David Berg Foundation for making this wonderful series of exhibitions on medieval Jewish art in context possible. I also want to thank uh, Anne Young of the John Rylands Library in Manchester for her help and support throughout the course of my research on the Rylands Haggadah. The Haggadah, the home service for the eve of Passover, has a long and um, distinguished history. <laughs> the 
Throughout it, that history, it has been lavishly illustrated. Can one, after all, conceive of a ritual moment more central to the Jewish experience as a whole than the Passover Seder? Can one conceive of the Seder without the Haggadah? And although they tend to be taken for granted, can one conceive of the Haggadah without the illustrations that accompany them? The earliest surviving illustrated manuscript Haggadah is the so-called Bird's Head Haggadah from the southern Rhineland Valley, possibly Mainz, uh, written around 1300. We'll have occasion to briefly revisit this strange manuscript a bit later. Most other early examples originate in Spain. Some, like the Barcelona Haggadah depicted here, have intertextual illustrations. Other Spanish Haggadot, including the Rylands Haggadah, the subject of my talk this afternoon, contain a series of illustrations of the biblical narrative leading up to the Exodus in pages that precede the actual text of the Haggadah proper. The manuscript tradition continued even well after the advent of printing, with hand-illuminated Haggadot both imitating and riffing off printed books throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. In this example from Hamburg in 1740, the title page is similar to those found in printed Haggadot like the Amsterdam Haggadah of 1695. We see a gateway flanked by figures of Moses and Aaron, in this manuscript, black and white engravings of the printed Haggadot have been transformed into a colorized version and given a naive flair. The drapery of the figures, for instance, is rendered in a plainer, decorative manner that suggests little acquaintance with classical conventions, even the classical conventions that had already been somewhat butchered in the engravings of the Amsterdam Haggadah. The 19th, and early through mid 20th century saw an explosion of printed Haggadot designed by artists, some, sometimes great ones. These books re-envisioned what had become a series of standard illustrations based on earlier printed Haggadot, Moses at the burning bush, the drowning of the Egyptians in the Red Sea, the four children representing four different educational approaches to talking about the Exodus on the Seder night, the family at the Seder table, and several others. Here's some sample pages from the wonderful Offenbach Haggadah, a collaboration between Siegfried Guggenheim, the patron and planner, Fritz Kredel, the artist, and Rudolf Koch, the typographer, who together imagined a very Germanic, new Jewish Gothic style. As one passes the mid 20th century mark, Haggadah become more political, or so the accepted narrative goes. We find versions that begin to be gender sensitive, like this one by American artist Leonard Baskin, which includes the matriarchs, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. Contemporary examples, most with some kind of illustration, include overtly feminist and lesbian Haggadot, vegetarian Haggadot, secular Haggadot, hippie Haggadot, <laughs> historical Haggadot, Holocaust Haggadot, and hipster Haggadot. <laughs> this extremely individuated approach in which every Haggadah is my very own Haggadah is often and mistakenly viewed as a highly contemporary, even postmodern approach. But it should not be forgotten that as long as there has been a Seder night for some 2,000 years now, Jews have been obligated to view themselves as if they had personally come out of Egypt. And they have done so graphically in their illustrated Haggadot. They put themselves in the picture, making the persons and places of the Haggadah's narrative their own. The Haggadah itself, quoting the Mishnah, the code of Jewish law, expresses this in the language of commandment. In each and every generation, we must see ourselves as if we personally had come out of Egypt. Now these words alone, right, are eloquent exposition of the commandment of engaged memory. But this highly creative illustration of that passage by the artist David Moss really makes those words come alive. The right side of the open bifolium features a series of highly individualized heads in roundels, those of Jewish men, young and old, Eastern and Western, from every conceivable time period and in every historical manner of dress. 
These images are adopted from a variety of monuments of Jewish visual culture, familiar and obscure. Each roundel is flanked by others. These not decorated with images, but instead inlaid with tiny mylar mirrors. The left hand of the page, side of the page is similarly constructed, but here are portraits of women. The roundels with the portrait heads and mirrors alternate in a reverse pattern on the opposite folios, so that as one opens the book, the figures on each side of the page see themselves in the mirrors, and the user of the Haggadah, peering down at the open page, sees her or his own face reflected in the whole. Now, these pages strike me as a powerful metaphor for the idea of seeing oneself as if one had personally come out of Egypt. They're a tangible demonstration of the function of visual culture as a mirror into which Jews might project themselves and in which they might view themselves as actors in history, both presenting themselves via visuality and understanding themselves in its reflection. In truth, each and every generation has made the Seder and the Haggadah its own, whether in 15th century Darmstadt, where women and uh, discuss and debate the text alongside men. 19th century Pune, India, where matzah is prepared by nose-ringed women, just as it might be today in the ultra-hipstery, though not the ultra-orthodox, parts of Brooklyn. Morocco, early 20th century, where the four children are depicted with the wise child as a yeshiva student and the alienated or wicked child as a boxer or 1930s Budapest, where the wild child, wise child sorry, has become a Hasidic Jew in full regalia, and the alienated child is now a muscle Jew in peasant tunic, who yet somehow cannot abandon the practice of covering his head. And finally, in Arthur Schick's Haggadah of the 1950s, the alienated one is an assimilated German Jew with a monocle in his eye, sporting jodhpurs, a loden hat, a cravat, and kid gloves. He chomps upon a cigarette holder and has a riding crop tucked under his arm. The idea of my very own Haggadah is thus nothing new at all. You know, in fact, it's somewhat ironic that we perceive it as new, since all Haggadot since the advent of printing have been mass produced, whereas each and every medieval manuscript Haggadah was lovingly illuminated by hand for an individual person, family, or community. Thus, the highly individualized Haggadah, with relevance to its particular context, is not a postmodern phenomenon, but actually dates back to the Middle Ages. Likewise, the idea of the Haggadah as a book bearing a message beyond a simple retelling of the Exodus story, a message relevant to its particular context, should not be seen as an exclusively late 20th century phenomenon. In my new book, The Medieval Haggadah, Art, Narrative, and Religious Imagination, I examine four magnificent and enigmatic Haggadot with an eye specifically to these ideas. I explore the ways in which medieval Haggadot engaged issues of identity, how medieval Jews viewed themselves and visually described who they were, as well as politics, how Jews saw themselves in relation to the non-Jewish majorities among whom they lived in the Middle Ages. I discuss the aforementioned Bird's Head Haggadah, an attempt to get to the bottom of the mystery of the fact that in this book, many of the faces of human figures depicted throughout are replaced with those of birds. I consider the ways in which identity plays out in the manuscript, how Jews understood and represented themselves by means of these strange images. And I look at the golden Haggadah made in Barcelona around 1320. This is a manuscript upon which much scholarly attention has focused by virtue of the fact that with its northern French Italianate style, it is deemed to be, quote unquote, nearly identical with books made by and for Christians, like this contemporary legal manuscript. Funny, in other words, scholars have said, you don't look Jewish. I'm not sure what it means for a manuscript to look Christian. I regard medieval culture as a stream from which Jews and Christians fished side by side 
and from which they netted similar catches, elements both of style and iconography. What they did with these identical elements could be radically different, however. In the book, I argue, and I hope convincingly, that these illustrations, in spite of their similarity with contemporary Christian art, are not only deeply and inherently Jewish, but quite learned as well. I also discuss the Rylands Haggadah, our visitor here at the Met, thanks to the gracious support of the David Berg Foundation, and the focus of my discussion this afternoon. This wonderful manuscript, however, is not an only child. It is, as the title of my talk implies, a sibling. Its slightly older brother, also made in Barcelona only a few years earlier, currently resides in the British Library. Scholars agree that the brother Haggadah is the manuscript upon which the Rylands Haggadah was modeled. Thus, the designation brother is somewhat inaccurate. This manuscript is really the mother manuscript to the Rylands Haggadah, but I will retain the title Brother Haggadah here since this is the way in which the manuscript is most commonly known. One can't talk about the Rylands Haggadah without discussing its brother. The manuscripts are very different in style. The figures in the Brother Haggadah are much more highly modeled with dark underpainting, giving them an olive-skinned hue, not unlike images in Byzantine painting. The Rylands Haggadah is more conventionally Spanish with some French and Italianate elements. The figures flatter, less highly modeled, the decorative elements in each manuscript are similar. They include illusionistic ribboned frames rendered with more skill in the brother than in the Rylands Haggadah, as well as patterned backgrounds shot through with gold and emulations of various fabrics, including embroidered silk and brocade. From a connoisseurship perspective, the brother Haggadah is the more sophisticated manuscript. Its shading is more subtle, its illusionism more complete. But that doesn't make it the more interesting manuscript. That distinction, in my humble opinion, belongs to the Rylands Haggadah because of its more, well, its more contentious iconography. This contentiousness has not previously been noted. Just as the bird's head Haggadah is noted for its bizarre imagery, and the golden Haggadah is lauded for its high-toned, non-Jewish appearance, the brother and Ryland's Haggadot have always been compared for their quote-unquote nearly identical iconography. But I'm somewhat of a contrarian, you see. So when scholars write of nearly identical iconography of these two manuscripts, it only attracts my attention to the fact that nearly identical is only nearly identical. Sameness, after all, is not as interesting as difference. Consequently, I think we should seek out the differences between the brother Haggadah, the Rylands Haggadah and its brother that have been overlooked by previous researchers. When we discover those differences, what we find out is startling and I hope enlightening about the role of politics in medieval Jewish art. As we shall see, it's somehow appropriate that the Rylands Haggadah is the one that has struck out, trailblazed, made its way to America, while the brother has remained safely at home in England's green and pleasant land. For although both these manuscripts were made in Barcelona between 1330 and 40, and although the Rylands Haggadah was clearly based on the brother Haggadah, the two works could not in fact be more different. The brother, at home right now, snug in its bed in England, is conservative and quietistic, a good egg. But the Rylands, which has crossed oceans and spanned continents to visit us in the new world, is a bad boy, a naughty sibling, socially critical, religiously somewhat radical, and stridently political. Why is this the case? Well, to be quite honest, we don't know. <laughs> this is because both the Rylands Haggadah and its brother are orphan manuscripts, manuscripts for which we have no provenance information. 
In other words, we have no outside corroborating evidence regarding exactly where, when, why, or for whom they were made. This doesn't bother me, however. It's precisely this sort of thing that I take as a challenge. You see, most scholars in the field of Jewish manuscript illumination prefer to work with manuscripts that are localizable to particular scribes, schools, or communities, manuscripts that fall safely within the bounds of corroborating evidence. Working with such materials in a best case scenario, one could theoretically learn as much as possible about a particular place and time period and then plug in a manuscript of known provenance and date and be able to say something quite intelligent about the art within the known historical frame. <clears throat> Using art to corroborate historical events interests me far less than attempting to learn history from art. I don't mean history as in what happened, where, when, and to whom things happened. Rather, I'm interested in intellectual history, questions of what people thought and why they thought it, what the historians of the Annal School call Histoire des Mentalités. So it makes sense that I'm interested in the orphans. I'm intrigued by the fact that all we have to go on regarding manuscripts like the Rylands Haggadah and its brother is the internal evidence of the iconography and texts. I'm captivated by the fact that we can only understand the prospective intellectual context of these manuscripts via a series of deductions based for the most part on the iconography alone. In the case of orphans, Unlike the cases of manuscripts with colophons, that is, signatures, right? Manuscripts made by known scribes or manuscripts stylistically localizable to particular artists or schools, we don't have a historical frame for the art to corroborate. We need to look at the art itself and determine what it may be saying about the unknown historical frame. Now, doing this resembles nothing more than it does a detective story in the truest sense. It has all the, the, the appropriate elements, right? Fortuitous discovery, a trail of clues, a speculation, maybe more than one speculation. <laughs> True, it lacks resolution, but this is understandable. In the case of the Rylands Haggadah, we're dealing with a, a, a manuscript that by any contemporary standards is a cold case. In another decade, the protagonist will have been gone nearly 800 years. The Rylands Haggadah may have been created by Jews or by non-Jews working for Jews. We don't know. But one thing we do know is that this manuscript, which was very expensive, was created by whoever created it, Jew or Gentile, under the very direct guidance of Jews, some quite learned. After all, you don't commission a home to be built, say, by Frank Gehry and tell him to include as many bathrooms as he likes and to make the kitchen whatever size he wishes. An architect design home is an expensive enterprise, and the patron needs to have considerable input, regardless of what a genius the architect is. The golden Haggadah was the rough equivalent, both in price and patron-generated input, of a post-modern architect designed home. And the patrons were definitely Jews, so we're indisputably looking at a collaboration, a close one, between the designers and patrons and those who executed the designs. What were these patrons trying to express via the production of the artists? And what were the particular politics of the Rylands Haggadah, which I described before as socially critical, religiously radical, compared with its conservative and quietistic elder brother? I think it's pretty clear that the place to look if we want to see Haggadah's authorship, and by authorship I mean the constellation of patrons, uh, designers, artists, maybe rabbinic advisors, right? The authorship acting out, if we want to understand the emotional tenor of the manuscript, the place to look is in the description or the depiction of the plagues. Think about it. In the depiction of the plagues, with the opportunity it affords to show triumphant Jews and their discomfited em enemies, it's an excellent litmus test of the activism or quietism of the iconography of a given Haggadah. Some Haggadot, like the Bird's Head Haggadah, do not include any depiction of the plagues at all. Others, like the Golden Haggadah, 
illustrate the plagues with the same consummately courtly dignity that suffuses the rest of the manuscript, but go an extra mile to add a little special something reflective of the particular sentiments of the authorship. In the Golden Haggadah, the Plague of Frogs, for instance, is depicted per rabbinic legend as beginning with a single giant frog. But the authorship's special gift to us is the depiction of Aaron striking the big frog on the head and little frogs, tons of them, shooting out of the gargantuan frog's posterior. Yuck. This subtle detail, a detail I only noticed after perusing the Haggadah with my then eight-year-old daughter, Chevy, demonstrates the playfulness of the authorship in highlighting the repulsiveness of the plague in spite of the external air of courtly dignity in the rendering of the illumination. Let's see what the brother Haggadah does with the plague of frogs and how the Ryland's Haggadah responds. Hmm. Remember the old Wendy's ad, where's the beef? Well, where are the frogs? One can't help but notice that what is depicted here is not much of a debilitating plague, it's a minor nuisance at best. Indeed, when one compares the treatment of the afflicted, the afflicted Egyptians in the brother and the Ryland's Haggadot, one notes a distinct, almost comic amplification in the Ryland's Haggadah's treatment of the theme. We go from a measly three frogs to a robust 15, right? Admittedly, they're not emerging from a froggy posterior, but still a pretty impressive increase. What about the other plagues? The beasts are pretty horrible, yet somehow cute in the brother Haggadah, right? But the Ryland's Haggadah has lots more beasts biting in lots more intimate places, with Pharaoh having to physically ward off one who goes for his crotch, but ends up biting his knee. Right? And while Pharaoh's scowl is evident in the brother Haggadah, with his neat little teeth showing, there's a little paint chip here, but you know that, that originally was brown, you just see his neat little teeth showing, his grimacing mouth and those of his courtiers spread ear to ear in the Ryland's Haggadah. A lot more discomfort, I would say. The plague of hail is, again, not much of a plague in the brother Haggadah. Pharaoh's crown is knocked askew by a couple of stray hailstones. By way of contrast, in the wintry wonderland of hail in the Ryland's Haggadah, Pharaoh is placed in the extremely undignified position of trying both to steady his crown and to pull his cloak over his head due to the relentless onslaught of divinely precipitated nasty weather. The locusts in the Brother Haggadah are nearly lost against the background panel. You have to almost engage in a Where's Waldo style of locust hunt, right, to find them. Um, there are many more of them, much more distinctly rendered in the Ryland's Haggadah. While the real difference in the volume and intensity of the plagues is patently obvious in side-to-side -side comparisons such as these, one might chalk up the details of these two manuscripts as, uh, you know, that one wishes to regard as basically similar to chance or to whim. One might but one would be wrong. Evidence concerning manuscript illumination and the testimony of postmodern illuminators alike points to the fact that every extra locust painted required an expenditure of time on the part of the artist, which translated into an extra expenditure of money on the part of the patron. Each amplification of the plagues, indeed each grimace and gesture, is thus thought out and deliberate. The agenda of the authorship of the Ryland's Haggadah comes through most strongly in the realm of the mood it imposes upon the Exodus narrative. Unlike the polite and even sympathetic, look at the sort of dark circles around the eyes, sad eyes, right? Um, uh, the empathetic attitude of the brother Haggadah, which seems to limit any potentially vengeful sentiments concerning the downfall of Egypt and the Egyptians, the Rylands displays a rather bloodthirsty, pitiless attitude with regard to the Egyptians, 
amplifying and intensifying such vengeful sentiments. Witness the plague of boils. Pharaoh and his counselors in the Brother Haggadah have lost all dignity. They are bare-legged, scratching at themselves, grimacing. But the Ryland's Haggadah adds an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented and extreme variation. Besides the much redder and more prominent sores, the lapdogs of the Egyptians lick their wounds. Now, we all know, heavens, some of us may even be, dog owners who allow their dogs to lick their faces. But I'm sorry, in my opinion, letting your dogs lick your diseased, infected, festering pustules is a little much, even for the most dedicated pet lover. This extra measure of disgustingness pushes the image and the manuscript over the edge into the realm of intentionally amplified hostility. This sort of hostile engagement is a more intense form of the little extra something added by the authorship of the Golden Haggadah in the Plague of Frogs. It amplifies the disgustingness of the plague, and by extension, it increases the well-deserved suffering of those who would dare to persecute Jews. Ah, well-deserved suffering. Nothing like it if you feel really persecuted, right? Um, or even if you don't, the Germans, bless them, have a word for it, uh, schadenfreude, joy in the suffering of others. It is something one should never engage in, but in which we all end up engaging under the right circumstances. The authorship of the Rylands Haggadah seem to have regarded nearly any circumstance as the right circumstance for the injection of a little schadenfreude. The right at Lenz Haggadah oozes schadenfreude. Check this out. The plague of hail in the brother Haggadah includes the image of an Israelite herdsman, safe and warm, tending his flocks amid a flowery landscape in the land of Goshen at the bottom left. Above, in Egypt proper, the Egyptian herdsman has died. He's not just sleeping. Closed eyes in this manuscript are an are, um, are, uh, uh, indication of death. Um, uh, has died, pelted uh, by a relatively small and seemingly localized hail shower next to his likewise unfortunately deceased animals. In the Rylands Haggadah, the hail has taken over the entire upper register. The Egyptian herdsman, not dead yet, um, mourns the death of his animals, lifting his hands in distress. Below him, in an even more flowery landscape, the Israelite shepherd points rudely at him, a self-satisfied smirk on his face. This contrast exemplifies the difference in the treatment of suffering in the two manuscripts. The brother Haggadah tells it like it was, with no more triumphalism than is necessary. The Rylands Haggadah, however, liberally sprinkles the narrative with schadenfreude, really gives it to the Egyptians, and think about it, by extension, to contemporary enemies of the Jews. Should one rejoice in the downfall of one's enemies? The Talmud relates that when the Egyptians were drowning in the Red Sea and the Israelites singing praises of God on the shore, the angels desired to join in the song. God, livid with anger, thunders at them. The words, works of my hands are drowning in the sea, and you have the chutzpah to want to sing? Note that God does not condemn the Israelites. They had, after all, been enslaved for centuries. They had the right to celebrate the ignominious end of their oppressors, punished measure for measure for drowning the Israelite newborns in the Nile. But the angels? What harm had the Egyptians ever done to them? This story cuts to the heart of the question of the proper Jewish response to salvific events that involve the downfall of one's enemies. Although the Haggadah unequivocally asserts that the salvation of the Israelites was the result of the strong hand and outstretched arm of God alone, 
In the biblical text, we are told that Israel left Egypt hamushim. This odd word, hamushim, may mean in groups of 50, or it may mean that the Israelites left Egypt armed. So the question arises, was the victory of the Israelites really the result of divine intervention alone? Or did Israelite military prowess have something to do with it? And if so, should that prowess be noted and celebrated? It says something about the climate, both exegetical and experiential, in mid-14th century Catalonia, that both the authorship of the Brother Haggadah and the authorship of the Rylands Haggadah chose to depict armed Israelites in the scenes of the Exodus and those of the crossing of the sea, not Israelites in groups of 50s, right? But as you now might expect, there are considerable, even vast differences in the manner in which this armed Exodus is depicted in each manuscript. Of the 12 Israelites depicted in the Exodus scene in the Brother Haggadah, only four are shown wearing helmets. One, two, three, four. Two of these visibly equipped with scabbards here. This one has a scabbard also, but it's hard to see what it is. And a fifth figure where it bears a scabbard but has no armor. Right? So four with helmets, two with scabbards, a fifth figure with a scabbard but no armor. You notice I mentioned scabbards, not swords. Well, when he was about five years old, my son, Gabi, all my kids are art historians for some reason, um, pointed out something extremely interesting about this illumination. Always keen to look closely at pictures of knights in armor, what kid isn't, right? He noted that the armored Israelites in the Brother Haggadah, in fact, bear empty sheaths without swords. Now, this might be chalked up to a simple error on the part of the authorship of the Brother Haggadah, but I honestly don't think that the patrons of such an expensive manuscript would have missed this if my five-year-old noticed it after looking at it for two seconds. The lack of swords here may deliberately signal the ambivalence of the brother authorship regarding the idea of an armed exodus. Of the 12 Israelites then, five are armed in some incomplete way. And there are seven completely unarmed, unhelmeted figures, a majority. Five of these are white-haired elders, including Moses and Aaron. Now, the hair and beards of Moses and Aaron here are consistently brown or gray in every other instance in the manuscript. But here they're depicted with white hair and beards, as if to emphasize their role as prophetic elders rather than military generals. The only Egyptian denizen of the city shown is a trumpeter sounding the alarm and pointing at the escaping Israelites. The small number of armed figures, the interspersion of many unarmed ones, and the elderly figures of Moses and Aaron converge with the particular choice of wording in the caption. All these illustrations are captioned of this illustration. The caption omits any mention of an armed exodus, focusing rather on the fact that the Israelites heeded Moses' instructions. The scene in the Brother Haggadah thus is less of a display of military prowess than of a people subject to divine command. The parallel illustration in the Rylands Haggadah illustrates the same event in an entirely different key. Here it is played out by what is literally a nation of warriors. The text caption explicitly emphasizes the military accoutrement, including the verse, and the children of Israel left Egypt armed. In this representation of the Exodus, only one of the 13 Israelites depicted is clearly unarmed, while at least 11 bear arms. The scene is visually dominated by armed and helmeted men, and it fairly bristles with armaments, pikes, and spears along the top. Five Egyptians watch and point from the ramparts of the city, almost as if they've been summoned by the trumpeter in the Brother Haggadah. 
Now, I know this sounds funny, the idea of an illustration in a later Haggadah being a continuation of an illustration in the earlier Haggadah, its model. But I'm actually working on a project now on what I call implied ensuing motion. That is, what is implied to take place after the moment frozen in time in a given illumination. In this case, we may be witnessing a sort of jocular homage from the authorship of the Rylands Haggadah to the authorship of the Brother Haggadah on which it is based. The Brother authorship depicts a trumpeter sounding the alarm, and the Rylands authorship responds, depicting the consequences of the alarm, people appearing on parapets, pointing, right? While at the same time acknowledging its depth to the authorship of the earlier manuscript. At this point, this is only an observation, but I hope you agree it's an interesting one. By way of contrast with the armed Israelites in the Brother Haggadah who bear empty sheaths without swords, the armed Israelites shown in the Rylands Haggadah most definitely bear swords in their sheaths, their pommels clearly visible. The Rylands authorship is swift to correct the anomaly that they, like my son Gabi, observed in the Brother Haggadah and to get as many swords into as many sheaths as possible. The crossing of the Red Sea affords still another opportunity to depict the armed exodus. And again, each manuscript's authorship treats it in a different manner. The brother Haggadah shows the scene in four bands across the page, evenly divided between drowned Egyptians and saved Israelites. The scenes of the drowned Egyptians, depicted in just two bands, are relatively low key. The Egyptians number only five, and the peacefulness of their faces make it seem as if they are merely asleep. The depiction of the Israelites is somewhat strange. Although all wear helmets and bear swords and shields, the majority of the men in the scene shown in the Brother Haggadah are gray-bearded elders, hardly an army, right? Additionally, women are included among the group, and the spears, here are the women, by the way, they're wearing traveling hats, one, two, three, four, right? And the spears that are visible are so thin, they're white, except for one or two, and so light-colored that they almost disappear against the backdrop. The caption accompanying this illustration emphasizes trust in God rather than describing Egypt's downfall. Throughout the Brother Haggadah, the authorship shows the afflicted Egyptians without schadenfreude, as we've said, and also consistently avoids excessive celebration of the salvation of the Israelites, lest it appear too vengeful and triumphalistic. There's a, a term in Yiddish for this, pasnisht. It's not nice, right? Don't be, don't be unnecessarily mean, right? But an image of the crossing of the Red Sea showing the salvation of the Israelites and acknowledging the downfall of the Egyptians is unavoidable. To soften this, the Israelites are imagined here not as an army, but as a diverse group of individuals, including women and elderly people, whose victory is the result of trust in God rather than strictly in military prowess. In the Rylands Haggadah, the crossing is depicted in five bands across the page, a full three of which, instead of two, is devoted to the drowning of the Egyptians. The drowned Egyptians are shown grimacing in pain, as opposed to the peaceful, almost blissful smiles on the faces of the Egyptian dead in the Brother Haggadah. The Rylands Haggadah once again diverges from the Brother Haggadah, its model, intending toward vengeful themes. The captions here speak of divine retribution upon the Egyptians. And in the illumination, triumphalism is manifest, as I mentioned, in the amplification of the visual depiction of Egyptian suffering, as well as in the characterization of the Israelites as a nation of soldiers. There are no elders here, only young men armed to the teeth, bearing thick spears. And women are noticeably absent from this war party. The theme of schadenfreude is continued here with Moses and Aaron pointing mockingly at the drowning Egyptians and two of the soldiers completely contorting their bodies to engage in the same disrespectful gesturing. You see them? Here's Moses and Aaron pointing, right? And here the soldier's body is going in this direction, but his head and hand have turned. Likewise here, the same thing. The centrality of triumph and vengeance of the Israelites is familiar from the treatment of the plagues in the Rylands Haggadah. 
in which Israelite immunity is shown consistently alongside Egyptian affliction in a triumphalistic mood, mode. The difference between the visual content and emphasis of the uh, captions in these two illustrations creates a shift in political sensibility. The brother Haggadah, with its subtle de-emphasis on vengeful themes, privileges the narrative of the trust of the Israelites over the description of the downfall of the Egyptians. But that bad boy, the Rylands Haggadah, true to its tendency toward greater vengefulness, highlights the retribution upon the Egyptians. The authorship of each Haggadah has configured what appears at first glance to be identical material in a manner that is actually strikingly different. The emphasis that each has imparted to the scene, a feeling of restraint in the case of the brother Haggadah, and a heightened sense of militarism and vengeance in the case of the Rylands Haggadah, its naughty sibling, echoes everything that has gone before in the two books, bolstering the distinctive position of each authorship's larger conceptual framework. All this comparison begs the question, why? Why is the Rylands Haggadah so naughty relative to its proper, sober, elder brother. Jews were actually relatively comfortable and for the most part secure in early 14th century Barcelona. Yet it's obvious to the reader of contemporary liturgical poetry, for instance, and belles lettres, that Spanish Jews at the beginning of the 14th century still felt a strong undercurrent of concern, if not outright fear, that their comfort was temporary and their stability was ultimately fleeting. Long and bitter experience in exile had taught them that officers of the government might descend upon them at any moment, like, well, like Pharaoh and his knights. And their tradition repeated often, like a mantra, that the cycle of persecution would be endless until the coming of the Messiah, and that any lull in oppression was merely a temporary phenomenon. As the text of the Haggadah itself puts it, more than one oppressor has stood up against us to put an end to us. Indeed, in each and every generation, they stand against us to put an end to us, but the Holy Blessed One saves us from their hand. Now, such concerns are completely understandable when a minority, in fact, has been persecuted over and over again. Can any African-American parent with adolescent sons ever really sleep securely in America? And such fears were proved correct just 50 years after the creation of the Rylands Haggadah with the terrible persecutions of the 1390s and confirmed with the eventual expulsion of the Jews from Spain just over a century later. The mantra-like repetition of sentiments of existential discomfort year in, year out, certainly had repercussions for the Jewish psyche. There were two ways in which Jews could have reacted. They could have responded in a quietistic, passive, conciliatory way, or they could have responded in a more aggressive, proactive, militant, vengeful way. They took both approaches in their actual lives, sometimes trying to reconcile themselves with the harsh decrees against them, attempting negotiation with the authorities, conciliation, but at other times, protesting, committing acts of defiance, sometimes even martyring themselves. And their virtual life, the life of their visual culture, reflects both quietistic and activist stances as well. The group of armed Israelites in the Rylands Haggadah speaks loudly and clearly. Pharaoh and his troops were not the only ones prepared to engage in battle here. And layered on top of the militarism and the protectiveness, there is the vengefulness and schadenfreude. The Rylands Haggadah responds to its good, quiet, well-behaved sibling in a broadly reactive manner which leads one to wonder what the circumstances were that led to such a response. Did something particular happen in the communal or familial context in which the manuscript was produced that led to such a harsh, schadenfreude-filled visual commentary? Or was it simply a contention on the part of the authorship of the Rylands Haggadah that the quietistic attitude of the brother Haggadah was unrealistic? Did the Rylands authorship believe that the brother authorship had mistaken a period of relative calm in Jewish-non-Jewish -Jewish relations for a long-term convivencia, which it was not? Did the Rylands authorship believe that Jews were involved in an eternal struggle with their enemies? 
Did it feel that the brother authorship sought to gloss this over just because there was uh, what the Rylands Haggadah authorship believed to be a temporary lull in outright hostilities? At the end of the 21st century in America, sentiments of eternal struggle and the images that emerge from such attitudes tend to make us uncomfortable. And it's a good sign that they do because it means that we're no longer comfortable with revenge fantasies since perhaps we need them less. Nonetheless, we would do well to remember that images like these were created against a backdrop of images like these, where in the pervasively Christian culture in which Jews lived, proclaimed the dominance of Christians and Christianity over Jews and Judaism, depicting G Jesus's Jewish tormentors with animal-like physiognomies, and depicting Judaism personified by synagogue, the synagogue, as blind and abject. Faced with such images and attitudes, it is no wonder that the politics of love and reconciliation were not really on the plate for the Rylands authorship. Jews were a demographic minority in the European Middle Ages, occasionally envied, sometimes despised, usually misunderstood. Coupled with actual incidents of persecution, the imagery to which the Rylands authorship were no doubt exposed on a daily basis bred in the iconography they created a series of responses to non-Jewish majority. There were revenge fantasies troped as responses to the ancient enemies of the Jews, the Egyptians, in the Haggadah. In the Ryland's Haggadah, political elements are central. The art responds to a climate of at least perceived, if not actual, persecution, and to the resulting general feeling of enmity between Jews and Christians, even at the best of times during the high medieval period. Was this feeling of enmity justified? Recent research into the actual situation of the Jews in the High Middle Ages in both Spain and Franco-Germany testifies against the idea that life for Jews in the Middle Ages was an unremitting stream of persecution, a veil of tears. On the contrary, according to most recent scholarship, it was sometimes awful, but for the most part it was actually on a case-by-case, day-by-day basis, pretty stable. But if you read medieval Jewish texts, echoing as they do the sentiments expressed in the Haggadah and other rabbinic writings, you would not know this. It was the non-normal parts, the awful parts, that seemed to have most impacted the consciousness of medieval Jews about their own situation. There was a large gap between the reality of medieval Jewish life, sometimes awful, for the most part pretty stable, and its perceptions and description by Jews through the rabbinic lens of, in each and every generation, they stand against us. It is to this feeling of constant existential threat that the Rylands Haggadah responds. We certainly shouldn't expect the politics revealed in the Rylands Haggadah to be palatable to us at the beginning of the 21st century. Our contemporary Haggadot are, after all, feminist, emotionally and spiritually questing, concerned with ethics, with loss, with restoration, with equity. The political slant of 21st century Haggadot is, by and large, a politically correct one left-leaning, social justice-oriented. They manifest a willing eagerness on the part of their creators to embody a universalistic ethos, to put the hurts of the past behind them, to live in the world in which Jews are liberated and which they now seek to help affect the liberation of others. If we seek a bad boy or bad boy sentiments among postmodern Haggadot, we must look elsewhere than these liberal Haggadot. And I'll finish up with this. Leave it to the Jews, often described as the ultra-Orthodox, who call themselves simply Haredim, Quakers, those who tremble before God, to produce Haggadot that are simultaneously postmodern and manifestly politically incorrect. Here's a fascinating illustrated Haggadah published by the Malchus Waxberger Press a couple of years back. This is the book that I am working on when I'm not working on medieval manuscripts, a plum example of what can only be called Haredi neorealistic kitsch. It's a book with something for everyone. It is replete with images that blend the narrative of the Exodus, pseudo-archaeological detail, like that Egyptian gazebo, and particularly apropos to the Rylands Haggadah, outrageously stereotypical representation of the Egyptian enemies of the ancient Israelites. The Egyptians here are effectively effeminized Arab types, swarthy and hook-nosed with too much eyeshadow, obviously reflective less of ancient Egypt than of contemporary Haredi attitudes towards those they see as present-day enemies. This hits home particularly in the plague scenes, which are played out with particular viciousness and 
Surprisingly, for a culture that opposes movie-going and almost cinematic horror and violence, Political it is, and most decidedly, not a politics of love and reconciliation. But just as we need to understand that the images in the Rylands Haggadah, against the backdrop of the constant mantra of in each and every generation they stand against us, and the constant bombardment with images like this, we need to remember that the Haredi world is still deeply scarred by the Holocaust, and that images like these are responses to memories and images from the camps, pictures with which most of us are only too familiar and from which I will spare you, substituting instead this image. Let me be clear, by pointing out that Haredi society is still deeply scarred by and reactive to the Holocaust, I don't mean to exonerate the repugnant attitudes of much of contemporary Haredi society toward non-Jews and the non-Jewish world. I simply intend to point to the context in which such attitudes and the images that spring from them were born. The Jets in the West Side Story famously argued to Officer Krupke that they are deprived on account they're depraved. The particular depravity of the harsh, vengeful, schadenfreude sprinkled iconography of the Rhineland Sagada may be due to the general scars and paranoia of Jews living in exile, or it may be linked to some exact particular circumstantial reasons in the intimate community or familial context of the manuscript that will likely never be recovered. As much as we learn about Barcelona between 1330 and 1340, we may never, additionally, know exactly why the relatively quietistic iconography of the Brother Haggadah was so radically remapped in the Rylands Haggadah. What we do know is that whatever the social, political, intellectual, theological context was for each manuscript, these contexts were as different as different can be in spite of the apparent similarities of the manuscripts. So if I've intrigued you to learn more, to look more closely, to think harder about the fact that no two works of art, like no two people, are ever even nearly identical, and that the circumstances surrounding the creation of any work of art differ vastly, I consider my time with you this afternoon well spent. You know, what I've been doing with these manuscripts would never have been possible years ago when I first started studying medieval art. The ability of technology to bring high-quality images of different manuscripts together has revolutionized what we can do. But even more important than that, the new climate of openness with regard to Jewish visual culture to be wished Chad Sameach by the curator of the, of the Metropolitan's Medieval and Cloisters, right? It has finally allowed us uh, to see the integration of the display of Jewish art alongside and in the context of the general medieval collections. This is the fulfillment of a dream I have had ever since I was an extremely young boy visiting this museum. More recently, as a writer and thinker about med medieval Jewish visual culture, I'm just blown away by how wonderful it feels. And yes, I mean feels, for the intellectual thrill is huge, but the existential feeling of justice, vindication, and pride is monumental to see these great works of Jewish manuscript illumination displayed in compact, intelligent presentations that accomplished exactly what the title of the exhibition say they will, contextualizing medieval Jewish art these exhibitions and the commentary we scholars make upon them will certainly lead to better understanding of the contributions of medieval Europe's premier demographic minority to the wider world of medieval visual culture in general. What a pleasure to be able to glimpse the sentiments of the people who made these gorgeous books in history's mirror by grace of art. Thank you very much. If you want to be in touch with me, write down my, my uh, website address and uh, we can be in touch. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon.